Thanks for hanging out with me today. Uh, my name is John Harper. I am a security engineer at Tenable. Uh, uh, currently, I'm, I'm really hanging with the Tenable AD product. I'm a SME for that product. Um, so if you're familiar with Tenable, uh, you, know, you know we are the makers of Nessus, the vulnerability scanner. Um, anyway, I've been a offensive security practitioner, penetration tester uh, for most of my professional career and, you know, a few years actually of that are not my professional career <laughs> too. Anyway, um, before joining Tenable, uh, I was the team lead for Nationwide Insurance Attack and Penetration Testing Team. Uh, and I've been a part of several different security programs for various Fortune 500 companies like American Electric Power, uh, Home Depot, and uh, also like uh, Huntington Bank. Um, you may have uh, heard of me actually from Hackers Teaching Hackers. Uh, it's a security practitioner conference I founded here in Columbus, Ohio, uh, where I call home. And no, I'm not a Buckeye. I just live amongst the nuts. Um, <laughs> originally, uh, I, I was actually asked to speak with Derek Milber, uh, who uh, is our principal evangelist, and he's also a Microsoft MVP. He was going to showcase uh, basically the complexity around AD to understand like how even like a really seasoned pro can struggle with understanding the all the crazy complexities of AD. Uh, unfortunately, Derek had to drop out last minute, so you're you're stuck with purely the hacker perspective, which is why I changed the title to a hacker's perspective on AD. Um, but again, thanks uh, for hanging out. Um, and since I can, I'm going to go ahead and do some shameless plugs here. So before I get started, uh, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about Hackers Teaching Hackers, which we call HTH for short. Uh, HTH gathers annually at BrewDog in Canal Winchester. Since you guys like beer, I figured this would be appropriate. Uh, BrewDog is both actually a brewery and a distillery, uh, complete with a attached hotel. Uh, it's called the Dog House. And uh, it's a really unique venue. It's where you can actually, in your hotel room, you can get a shower beer or enjoy a keg in your room, things like that. Um, as you would expect, we do have some amazing speakers. Uh, I don't know if you recognize any of those faces in there, but uh, Johnny Long, who's the founder of, Hack of uh, Hackers for Charity. He's also the original uh, Google Dork founder. Uh, and then like Dave Kennedy, Sean Metcalf, Bryson Board, uh, Tim Medine, who uh, invented Kerber Roasting, things like that. So we've had some really uh, great community support from uh, the InfoSec community. It's just been fantastic. Um, the focus that we have, so every conference is, you know, in the world probably has their own little spin on how they want to go about uh, producing content for uh, people that come and want to make it valuable, right? So we focus on really hands-on villages. Uh, we certainly have our oral presentations, but we really want to solidify those concepts with hands-on exercises. Uh, our motto is we're all hackers, we're all learning with something to share. And it doesn't matter if you're red or blue or at the end of the day, whatever, um, you know, we're all hacking to make things work the way we need them to for our day-to-day -day jobs. And that's why we're hackers. Um, and we believe that a community really without ego is the key to success, um, which is also why we have a mentorship village. And, um, you know, we also have the ability to uh, do some job placement as well. So every year we do bring, of course, a CTF to the attendees uh, to test their technical prowess. We also have a scavenger hunt for those who are maybe a little bit less technical, but like the analytical puzzle solving stuff. And then of course we do have really super cool electronic badges that once unlocked can typically be used as basically your own personal attack platform amongst some other things you may wanna do with it. Um, and the badge shown there in this picture is actually from our last November's conference where our theme was tales from the script. <laughs> it was capacitive, it's pretty cool. And then the last slide, I swear, and then I'll actually get to the topic at hand today, um, is really, I just wanted to say thanks to all the HTH staff uh, and community volunteers. Really, it's, uh, it's, it takes a village to put it together. Uh, not everybody was able to make it into this year's photo, um, but definitely wanted to give them a, a huge shout out. Um, and you know, feel free, uh, jump out to hackers or hthackers.com to learn more. Uh, there's also a link to our Discord community uh, on that website as well. Okay, cool. Enough of that. Um, yeah. So basically, this is the agenda. I just want to talk real briefly. Where are we today? Why are we talking about 80s? Isn't it really old? <laughs> and just some common gaps and issues. I mean, shouldn't we have solved all the problems with 80? It's like 20 something years old now, right? Unfortunately, no. 
Um, and then I'll, I'm going to demo some of the methods that I use to exploit AD throughout my penetration testing career. And hopefully you'll learn some new fun ways uh, that you can gain persistence in AD. So uh, hopefully there's some good stuff there for you. All right, so where are we today? I mean, there's really lots of different career focus areas for security. Uh, and these days really uh, to make things simpler for end users and faster to market for companies. Um, you know, there's really, we've made it even more complex uh, of a world to live in. You know, the malicious actors have a huge attack surface area to work in. I mean, heck, the, the cloud alone, well, I mean, really it's super cool, is, has basically duplicated all of our headaches. Um, so really just a, a shout out, kudu, kudos uh, really for uh, those blue team ninjas that work tirelessly to protect our organization. So just uh, thanks for that. I, I, I think a lot of times they go unsung and on. So I like to give a big thanks to those, those folks. The, the red teamers always get all the praise and, and things like that, but I figured I'd start by thanking the blue team. Um, so cool. Um, you, might be the cover... first, uh, you might be the first red teamer that's thanked the blue team, but I think, <laughs> I think we appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, it's a cat and mouse game. The blue team only makes the red team better. So. Um, so really kind of where we are today, th this is really kind of a recent uh, CISA quote that they had a, about the recent log for shell vulnerability. Um, you know, attackers may be laying dormant, waiting until alert levels have fallen before utilizing access to obtain, they've obtained through log for shell. Okay, ultimately, uh, you know, log for shell, uh, it's just one of a never ending string of software vulnerabilities. I mean, it's, it's, it's there putting our data, money, lives, dangers, and at risk, to which I say, what's new? Uh, you know, so you hear lots of stuff in the news today. There's always some crazy nickname like, you know, log for shell, heart bleed, dirty cow, shell shock, purple monkey dish. Okay, I made that last one up. Um, but my point is that we need to stop buying the nickname hype and focus on security hygiene, just basic stuff. Uh, and I, <laughs> I want you to guess how many times I needed a traditional CVE vulnerability to exploit as a penetration tester in order to like, quote unquote, win an engagement. Uh, go ahead, get, get a percentage in your head, I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> All right, so the answer is like 1% of the time. And of that like 1% of the time, it's likely that I was really forced to use one of those per the rules of engagement because they just wanted to see what could be done with it. So, you know, Tenable doesn't like it when I, I say that sometimes because after all, we're kind of a vulnerability management company and we're telling everybody, hey, you should, you know, patch and know where all your vulnerabilities are and make sure they're short up. Very important to do that. Certainly that's low hanging fruit, you know, but at the end of the day, they're, they're kind of some bigger fish to fry, just general hygiene stuff. Cause I, you know, I can tell you, I didn't lose engagements hardly ever. It was like, I was in before lunch and I was looking for some really good place to go eat. So, uh, yeah, it's advanced slide. There we go. So, uh, the question is how did you get in if you didn't use an exploit? Well, pick your poison. Uh, <laughs> this is from, that's, uh, images from Jackbox games There's a murder mystery, uh, game. It's fantastic. My kids love playing that. Um, but really there's, there's a lot of ways you can get in, uh, there's phishing, right? I don't always need a link either in a phishing email, right? And you're like, Oh, I got a phishing, you know, link remover thing. I don't care. Like I just talked to the user and going someplace manually. Um, and then they got what I was looking for. Uh, removal media, social engineering is always a win. Almost every time, I can't even begin to tell you how embarrassing. I've, I've had engagements where I was on a phone call and I had to pretend to be like an old grandma in order to gain access to an account. And I got in anyway, you know, and it's just amazing. Um, so that one usually works. Um, using valid accounts. Um, notice the theme with the last one. Default accounts, local accounts, cloud accounts. I didn't even mention AD accounts, really. Valid accounts kind of sort of overlaps over that, but uh, MITRE actually breaks them out separately. Um, so you, you definitely should see a, theme, see a theme about account access. That is definitely the theme for today. Um, and right, right now, I really, I love this picture because it has this drawbridge at the front, but it's clearly a half-baked countermeasure. 
the moat doesn't actually go all the way around it. You <laughs> a little thing on the side, people are climbing up the side, didn't have to go in the moat to get there. You know, and how many times do we do the same thing in our defensive postures? We say, oh yeah, we've got that. We, we've got a control for that. But in the end, we never really actually go back and validate that it's working correctly. Or we're doing point in time strategies where, you know, you might've grabbed the wrong point in time or just completely missed or worse. You find out that you thought you had a control, but it, it actually never existed. Uh, I've actually been part of audits where that was the case. And that's just really a bad situation to be in. Um, you know, and if really, if you follow security trends over the last decade plus, you know there is no moat around the castle. In other words, it's best to assume that the attackers are already inside when planning your defensive strategy. So uh, let's uh, seed you ahead with the understanding that basically there is an abundance of ways attackers can get in. And if you're still kind of wondering, hey, how can they get in, check out that MITRE link. Uh, that is the uh, initial access tactics that they have listed for uh, ways attackers could possibly get in. Notice they actually, if you list, look those, uh, look at those, they don't have social engineering as one of the items, um, but it was very effective for me. Uh, most of which will be account related. Um, so when you think about accounts and, and the access they have, what do you typically think of? it should probably be Active Directory or, you know what I mean? Like it should be <laughs> some sort of directory structure. Um, it holds the keys to the kingdom. We deploy our software with it. We control access to systems and applications, email, and much, much more. It absolutely is a huge target for attackers. It was for me, it was the first thing I'd go after, after I basically did a little basic recon on the, my first foothold uh, on a box. And in case you don't believe me, believe me here's a marketing slide. Um, but seriously, um, I did steal it from our marketing team. Um, sometimes our marketing team does get things right, typically when they actually talk to a techie that actually knows what they're actually doing. But um, ten their tenable security research team, uh, they actually are, they're total rock stars. They, they found over 130 zero day vulnerabilities on their own this last year when our closest competitor only found three. Anyway, they analyzed all the recent known malware and determined that nearly 60% of it included specific code to target Active Directory. And if the malware didn't actually find Active Directory, it just died. It just died because it was like, eh, whatever, I don't care. So uh, is that going after, sorry, John, to yeah. keep interrupting you, but so is that like going after Active Directory uh, accounts or when you say like targeting Active Directory, what's, is it, I guess, can you explain that a little more? Yeah, well, there's lots of ways they could go after Active Directory. The, the malware could be uh, doing recon to actually identify accounts that have permissions or things like that. Or, um, you know, if you think about like, if you've ever used a power exploit, uh, you know, th there's lots of ways to do some initial access, you know, gathering of data of, the, of that environment. Um, so, I mean, there's a, there's a huge attack surface area. It's hard to say what it would do, but like short term, what attackers are trying to do typically there is deploy some sort of like ransomware using AD to wreak havoc, right? Cause if you're using AD to deploy software, you could deploy your ransomware with AD and then encrypt the entire network, not just like a single box. Um, so there's, there's that. Um, and then some attackers of course are in for the long long term, right? They want to dig into your resources so they can use your stuff for free, uh, really to run their own empires without having to buy equipment. Or, you know, they may just want to steal your, your intellectual property uh, along the way, just for kicks. So that's some of the stuff that they'd be kind of looking for with that. And they're just going to use account access that they that you, you know, basically once you, you hijack an account, whoever clicks it or whatever, um, they have some level of access. They're probably not just going to be a domain user. They probably have group memberships and they have access to some data. And so uh, that's where the hunt usually starts for a red teamer is, you know, you look around your surroundings once you're in some place and you, you find where you can go from there. So, um, cool. So uh, really to kind of make matters worse, uh, the responsibility for Active Directory <laughs> <laughs> falls pretty much on everyone. And you know what they say, like when it's everybody's responsibility, it's nobody's responsibility. And, and that's what we've, we've found frequently when talking to customers is that 
you know, it, they're like, well, well, we have to get all these other people on a call because there's some people that, you know, there's the security team, there's the AD administrators, all this other stuff. Um, it's funny because like the AD admins are like this rogue group to the InfoSec team. And the InfoSec team is like the police to the AD admins who, you know, really just want to drive down the road without getting a speeding ticket. Uh, and then you have your audit and compliance, which is typically perform like annual point in time assessments and, you know, can't keep up with the real time changes that are going on in AD, which happened pretty quick. Um, and then there's those, those pesky, pesky vendors, right? They won't stop emailing you and promising to save the world. Oh, wait, that's kind of me. Uh, on behalf of all the vendors everywhere, sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, we can probably all agree that our AD environments could probably stand to have a little bit of a deeper look. So let's kind of do that. Uh, so this is a high level AD uh, overview. I stole this graphic off the internet. There's a lot more to it. Um, but, you know, let's take a look at maybe what the attack surface might look like. Okay. Well, it looks like we have our work cut out for us, right? <laughs> I mean, this, this doesn't even include the sins of 80s past where administrators forgot to you know, maybe go back and clean things up, just general misconfigurations, you know, or maybe they didn't understand something because it's just, it's complex to understand some of the stuff within AD. Like I said, even some AD admins I've talked to that have been doing it their entire life don't know what features, certain features are when I ask about it. They're like, I don't know about that. Like, I'm not an AD admin and I knew about it. Um, so it's, it's uh, kind of surprising. Um, and then really, I guess the big one is, I uh, think about nested groups alone, like everybody struggles with nested groups and getting visibility with that. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really like a Friday the 13th movie. <laughs> so, um, so before we kind of jump in a little further, I figured I'd talk about some of the common issues that I had actually observed as a penetration tester. It's not, it's not exactly an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, um, but these were common things that I found. I'm not gonna read them all, but basically I found frequently that DCs were not properly network segmented, which of course left management services exposed like RDP, you know, using SMB so you could use PS exec on 445 or you know, RPC was open on 135. Basically, we need to do a better job of forcing attackers to have to obtain secondary credentials. Uh, that kind of leads me to uh, some additional stuff about credentials. So credential reuse is really bad. I can't tell you how many times uh, I'd, I'd hijack a domain admins account, primary account, and then I got their secondary credentials because they just incremented the, the password or they, this, this has happened frequently because they have the power to do so they just go ahead and set their password the same all the time and they never change it even though the, the password policy is there and says they have to change it they can just they've got the power to make it the same all the time um so that, that's happened frequently um so not only is that you know lazy it also makes the security controls completely pointless and there are things called fine-grained password policies for privileged accounts it's a feature that came out in server 2008 functional level I'm not saying that basically, you know, you have to make it so hard that you have to sacrifice a goat to log in. I mean, ultimately the, the length of the password matters exceptionally more than uh, complexity, exponentially more. Um, the use of passphrases instead of traditional passwords makes it easy to remember for you. It's easy to type and it's extremely hard to guess or brute force. So here's an example, like this is an 18 character password it's got white spaces in it, which are not common characters. All I did was replace an O, and that would be incredibly hard for an attacker to get. Very easy to guess. And then lastly, uh, Microsoft keeps releasing new features to stop attacks against AD, but they are rarely ever enabled. When I've been doing penetration tests, I rarely ever find those features ever get enabled. Um, we'll talk about some of those hopefully here a little bit later, but uh, I feel like the AD admins are like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like that seems to be the motto. <laughs> so like they don't, like Microsoft doesn't enable it by default when those functional levels get upgraded. Um, so it's just kind of interesting. So let's talk about some of the solutions people propose. Will agents save the day? Well, uh, it's one more thing to deploy and patch. It crushes endpoints in mass. Everybody gets agent fatigue and they can't be deployed everywhere. Can you put an agent on a printer or your network gear? How about your HVAC? Remember, Target got popped through their HVAC. 
uh, it's a huge target for attackers. And that's a, I mean, if you think about it, agents are installed as system. So if I can compromise with a CVE exploit, if you will, uh, or zero day, um, I, I own your system as system. Literally, I'm running as the system. So I, I have God mode on your box through that agent. Um, there's actually a lot of evidence to indicate that attackers are really, really targeting these agents because they know that these are on those endpoints. And if they can get vulnerabilities on there, then they can compromise you at, at a really risky level. Right? It's, it's not great. Um, and then, of course, they don't fix the root cause issues. They usually just detect or maybe kind of mask or maybe block even, but they don't uh, actually go back and fix the problem with AD. What about event logs? I always hear people say, oh, well, we log everything to our SIM, so therefore we're great. We got some scripts that run in the background, things like that. Well, not all the logs are enabled by default, typically. You have to go in there and enable some of those logs. And the, the event IDs are not complete. They don't contain anything about configuration information in AD, just that some of the event has happened. And it really takes a high effort and skill level to determine an incident. So if you look at this uh, over here, this flow chart, this is actually what it takes to determine if a golden ticket attack has occurred in your network. There's two ways it could happen, but these are the flows that you would have to go through as a SOC analyst to determine if this actually was a golden ticket attack. I mean, that's gonna take some time to go through. Uh, and when seconds count in an attack, then you really need something that's probably a little bit better than that. <laughs> Um, also, uh, you know, when you, you send every, the, everything to the SIM, I mean, that's great. SIMs are awesome. Uh, I love SIMs. It's a great way to kind of, and I'm going to vomit in my mouth to say it, but single pane of glass. Um, it's a great way to kind of bring all of the tools together and make them work for you uh, rather than trying to, and no one wants to stare at a single dashboard and a single tool. So, but they cost money, right? And usually per event kind of thing. Um, and then again, parsing scripts, typically not in real time. Um, I did do a little shout out here to what2log.com, a uh, buddy of mine, uh, Mick Douglas, who's a SANS instructor, principal SANS instructor, and uh, he has his own security company. Uh, he started this what2log page, and it's fantastic. So if you're really trying to figure out what you should log, um, maybe go check that out. Pretty cool. So, I mean, wouldn't it be great if there was a way to use native AD protocols to get live information? Uh, that actually included configurations, changes, and events. Well, I'm throwing in my vendor thing. There is. Uh, Sony, war warning, warning. Uh, I will be showing Tenable AD uh, product as I go through my hacking demo. It's really purely there to illustrate the gaps of AD and visibility. Um, but before I do that, I mean, I think it's important to understand basically what Tenable AD is doing in the background as I'm going through and doing that. So first we subscribe to the native AD replication service. This lets us see sysvol changes in TDS, anything like that will be happening in real time. Um, and because we don't use an elevated account, we're using domain user, um, we, our, our solution actually can't become a pivot point at that point other than domain user. Um, and then we look at all the configurations. We apply something called graph theory to it, which is just a fancy word for saying, we apply, we, we look at all the configurations and map multiple vertices to a single point uh, so like this user has this group membership, uh, and then also they're, uh, you know, in this, on this system and blah, 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 blah. So all, like a whole bunch of different things. And then that's now the vulnerability, not just one checkbox, right? Um, that lets us, uh, really connect the dots between all that information. And then lastly, we continuously monitor the replication stream for changes that can weaken your defenses. Uh, and then of course, even bubble up attacks. Um, we do look at event tracing for Windows logs that lets us see, um, you know, things from the kernel level, more real time, that kind of thing. So um, anyway, um, the idea of Tenable AD is to take the attack paths away from the attackers before they can get there. And that's what we call our indicators of exposure. So you can find the, the, the issues and kind of think of that like a Nessus scan before <laughs> so you get your list of vulnerabilities and then monitor for actual live attacks. And then of course, we don't use agents, domain user privileges, it's AD native, it's real time. And then we support, we support the platform in the cloud on-prem. Okay, I'm done about talking about product. 
Enough about that. Um, so according to the Verizon uh, 2021 Deber report, 80% uh, of the breaches within hacking involve brute force or the use of lost or stolen credentials. All I'm gonna say about that is I can vouch for that 100%, that's totally accurate. Um, so really, what does that mean? So when patch systems are patched and AD administrators will perform regular security audits, malicious hackers, penetration testers, whatever, continue to be um, successful at exploiting weaknesses in AD using those very basic techniques like password spraying and brute force guessing. Uh, the, the attacks are very simple, highly effective. They're hard to stop. Um, so really kind of where do we start? So I'm going to stop sharing a deck because that's lame. And let's start talking about uh, some hacking stuff. So before I jump into the demo, I do want to show this like a high level uh, overview of Tenable AD and then we'll, that way you understand what you're seeing. Um, so this is the real time replication stream. As it's happening, you can search it like you would with a sim, create queries, look through the, the pile of hay to find the needles. Um, indicators of exposures, literally what it says. So, uh, you know, prioritize. So critical at the top, least critical at the bottom. And then we give you a rundown of the vulnerability that you have essentially. Um, and then we also flag deviant objects, where we found it, what objects affected, reason for it. So, you know, where it's at. And then our indicators of attack is literally the indicators of attack as attacks are coming in, lights up like a dashboard. And then uh, we do a, give you a risk, uh, like a threat model view of topology of your domains. We have multiple domains of force. We show you the trust boundaries, the flows, if there's any dangerous trust levels, things like that. And then there's one more thing that I, didn't, I don't have on here yet because I'm on my on-prem lab. Um, but our SaaS platform is usually a quarter ahead and then we push that out. Um, but here's what it looks like. Uh, it basically is the blue teamers version of Bloodhound. So uh, hopefully that is viewable there. Um, but anyway, uh, you can kind of think of it like Google Maps, if you will, if you've never seen Bloodhound. Uh, basically you put in your starting point, your destination, where you want to go. And we show you all the roads that someone could take to get there. Uh, blast radius is basically, I take this account, I want to know where it can go. And then asset exposure is, I want to know who can actually get to this account or computer or object, whatever. So that is it in a nutshell. I'm done talking about the product, but I at least wanted to let you know what it looked like. Um, so let's go ahead and hack some stuff. Um, so I've got my Kali Linux box. Typically, I would say I would be on a Windows endpoint at this point, um, mostly because um, someone probably would have clicked on a phishing email or something like that. And then now I have uh, a domain joined trusted asset with a trusted user that's at least a domain user. In this case, um, I am going to work off of an untrusted asset. Um, I did an in map scan. I found a domain controller. I found a jump box and I found a mail server. Um, so that's cool. And I can see that like RDP is open. So again, segmentation was an issue in this particular uh, case. And um, I'm going to run a password spray against it because that's typically where I might start to get additional credentials. Um, I wrote this tool. It's called KSpray. You can download it off my GitHub. Just look for Rollins007. Um, KSpray is a Kerberos password spraying utility. You can password spray any service that requires authentication. The reason I chose to make this tool is because I hadn't seen anybody that had actually written one for Kerberos that does what I wanted it to do. Um, Kerberos is a very old protocol. So uh, it gives up a lot of information that you wouldn't expect to see. Uh, it, you know, like it, you wouldn't log, want to log into your bank account and like fat finger something and have it give you a response that says, hey, that's a great username, but your password was bad. Or you just want to have it say, oh, something bad happened, right? Well, Kerberos is way worse than that, like way worse. It allows you to enumerate all the KDCs in the environment just by asking. Uh, it also gives you positive and negative responses for user accounts, passwords, all that good stuff. Uh, it'll even tell you if the accounts are locked out from here. Pretty cool. So anyway, uh, I'm going to hit 60 random users with password password one and see what we get. Something you'll notice is that the trail flow over here, by the way, will start running through because it's going to see all those failed login attempts. You can see uh, bad passwords were identified, but these are good users. And then we can see that we had a hit. Bill Murray has the password password one. 
this user doesn't exist. Let's see, we caught password's brain. Um, this account is revoked or logged out, locked out. So we have credentials. Um, I will show you this just for kicks. Um, here's the attack. We can look at that. We can see. <clears throat> We can see the source destination. We can see the policy, which is tunable. You know, I had 40 failed login attempts in less than two minutes. You know, gives you um, the MITRE TTP for it. Um, if you're curious kind of how we overlay. So by the way, this is, MITRE is not even just awesome for like, uh, you know, doing defenses. It's actually a fantastic tool to use for vendor consolidation. When I was a practitioner, I'd get asked all the time, hey, how do I uh, whittle down the vendors in my environment that have duplicate stuff? Just use MITRE. There's fit it is to figure out where they overlay, right? So this is actually how Tenable overlays, uh, Tenable AD overlays. And so, yeah, it's super helpful actually for vendor consolidation too. Anyway, that's a pro tip. Um, cool. All right, so there's that. All right, let's go ahead and use the credentials. So we're gonna go ahead and log in. I could have used PS exec. You can argue with me all the different ways I can use these credentials, but for a demo, it's way cool just to use RDP. So I'm gonna try and connect to this exchange box. I love doing demos live. You never know if like something bad's gonna happen. All right, cool. So we got in. Uh, so now we're on a domain trusted asset and then it's the exchange server, which, oh my gosh, if you guys know anything about exchange, it's got permissions to everything. It's a spaghetti mess in AD. And uh, yeah, it's it, being here already has, I mean, it's pretty much game over. But um, anyway, all right. So let's see if we can run commands as an administrator. Ah, oh, man, we're not an admin, bummer. We're just a user. But there's things we can do, right? Like UMI dash all. Cool, so I am Bill Murray. Here's the SID for the domain, which that helps me understand, uh, well, that helps me with a golden ticket attack later, basically, if I can get the permissions to do so. Um, I also have the RID for the user, validates I'm not an admin. Uh, I can see the group permissions, which doesn't look like I have much of anything, but I can do net user, uh, sorry, users domain. And I can pull all the users back for the domain. Now I actually know real targets to go after. Net groups domain. And here's all the groups. So like, I don't know, like jump box. That's probably a good one. Or IT ops, things like that. So these are useful to query. We could be like net group. Uh, just if I can spell jump box. Cool. Um, we can see Ace Franklin's a member of Jumpbox. Then we can do a net user, A Franklin, just to figure out what all that user has. They're a plant manager and a Jumpbox. That sounds interesting, <laughs> right? So there's that. We could also do like net group. Hey, what do we want to be when we grow up? Domain admins. All right. So the domain admin, like in special, is one of them. Well, you know. You guys are probably familiar with DC sync attacks. Uh, it's it's a really, uh, it's an interesting attack that basically uh, allows an attacker to request information from the domain controller, um, basically tricking it into thinking that it uh, it is a domain controller. It requires the right permission set. Not just any user can run that. Um, you're gonna use a tool called Mimikatz probably to uh, leverage that but it allows you to return things like NTLM hashes and secrets from the domain. So when we look at this, we can see that um, AD, Tenable AD found that Bill Murray, the account that we do have, does have the extended DS replication synchronization permissions. So this account totally can do ADC sync. Now, how do we know that it could do ADC sync without us running Mimi gets? Uh, so boom. All right, so power split for the win, PowerShell. Uh, basically gives me the ability to run queries against the Active Directory environment as, a, as if I was using the Active Directory modules themselves as an administrator. Uh, in some cases, better, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not anything other than a do domain user. Right? I, don't have, I don't even have admin access locally, so I can do this without that. Um, now, when I queried that, uh, it, it, what I was doing was I was filtering out basically my user SID 
And I only need two of these attributes to be able to perform a DC sync. Three of them came back, so I definitely can perform a DC sync attack. So let's do that. And you're probably like, wait a minute, that's not Mimi Cats. That's correct. So this is where I get on my soapbox about uh, what you want to do is defend against the technique, not the tool, every time. So I downloaded Mimi Cats source code. I replaced all the strings, made my own Rollins 007 version of Mimi Cats, totally custom. So, you know, hopefully no one submitted it to virus total, but uh, I guess I'd have to recompile it again after that. But um, the idea is that, you know, you should be going after the technique. Now, maybe heuristics would pick it up, but who knows. Um, to also, I would probably not run it straight out of PowerShell. I'd probably run it from like regserve32 or run DLL32, which then makes this the child process where the parent process is a trusted Microsoft binary that you're like gonna be probably okay with, probably. Anyway, all right, done with that. So who do we wanna be? We wanna be the, the domain admin, which was, uh, oops, which is in special. So we'll do that. Boom, DC synced. Um, now, if we had reversible or plain text passwords, uh, they would be showing right here. Unfortunately, we don't have that in the domain. So we have to go grab like the NTLM hash for the domain admin. Um, but that's all good. Notice we've got DC sync. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take that hash, throw it in a file. I'm going to use Hashcat to crack it because it's GPU based. It's faster than John the Ripper, which is CPU based. Uh, so we'll go and do that. And the password is very secure one, which is obviously not very secure. So that's cool. We'll go ahead and see if we can connect to the domain controller with these credentials. And we can, we are now a domain admin. So that's cool. We'll kind of hang on to that access. <laughs> Probably a good place to be. Now, attackers don't really want to use domain admin accounts uh, for a lot, right? We want to blend in amongst the sheep. That's the goal. You, you really don't want to leverage more access than you need to do the job that you're there to do. Um, so what we want to do is find those accounts that have the access to the things that we need and use those. And that's, that's it. So I'm going to go back over here. Uh, remember, a Ace Franklin uh, or a Franklin was the user that had uh, plant manager access and the jump host. Uh, remember we had this jump host, uh, there was a group uh, that also she was a part of. So what I might do here is let's go into the domain um, users and computers. Cool, scan that out. Open that up, take a look at users. Let's go find Ace Franklin. Um, what we're gonna do is under the account, I'm going to click store passwords using reversible encryption because in this scenario, um, Ace Franklin used a password where when I did a DC sync, I couldn't crack the hash. Um, so probably used a really strong password that I couldn't figure out. So we're gonna enable that. Now you can see we caught storing passwords using reversible encryption. That should be an all or nothing. If you notice that there's uh, just one user that has reversible encryption, that's probably a good indicator that you have an attacker in there. So I'm gonna DC sync A Franklin now, and there's her password. Yeah, there's no way I was gonna crack that in any time, uh, any time at all. Like it, it, it was gonna, it would take forever. This is no way. Um, so cool, I have her password. Let's see if we can connect to that jump box now with Ace Franklin with that horribly long password. Cool, we're now in, oh, it's a, this is also an engineering control workstation. That's neat, so that's fun. Um, so let's, uh, let's open this up. Let's do an IP config. Let's just see. Oh, we're dual honed. So yeah, it's totally a jump box. We jumped from this network where we were. And now we also have access to this network. We do an ARP A. Let's see it. Okay, so here's some here's some boxes we've talked to in the past. Maybe that one. Let's see. Ping dash A 192.168.1.12. Yeah, that's an HMI. So that's cool. So it looks like, yeah, HMI01's right here. So let's open that up. Oh, sweet. 
we got access to an HMI. Now we can turn on and off pumps, maybe break the process. So that's cool. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's that's neat. Uh, so anyway, that's how we were able to access that jump host and cross boundaries. And notice we're doing this all through AD. We're not doing it. And this wouldn't get picked up probably because we're using the account that was trusted to go here in the first place. So that's cool. Um, so let's talk about some other things I might do actually as a bad guy. Um, let's see, what should we pick on? Um, so first of all, when you go into, into uh, the Active Directory users and computers, you should probably enable the advanced features view because otherwise you don't see everything. Um, but there is this uh, system now that shows up. And underneath here, there's something called admin SD holder. I don't know how many of you know about admin SD holder, um, but Microsoft uh, released this as a feature. I'm trying to remember what domain functional level. I want to say it was 2008, but I could be wrong on that. Don't quote me, except it's going to be recorded. So you're going to quote me anyway, probably. Anyway, um, the whole point of admin SD holder is to be an access control list for who should have access to the sensitive groups like domain admins, enterprise admins, things like that. It was intended to prevent admins from locking themselves out of the domain. Um, and there's a process that runs, it's called SD prop. It runs every 60 minutes on a domain controller by default. You can change it, but Microsoft does not recommend that you do it. Um, anyway, so when we go in here, you'll notice there's the security setting. And in here, we can do things like add a Franklin, which I already did for us, um, with write capabilities. So this access control list, this list of all these folks in here with whatever permissions they have, every 60 minutes get copied down to domain admins and enterprise admins. So when we look for those wonderful things, we can go to domain admins, that's a honeypot of one. We go into members, look, she's not there. It's, we're safe, right? Wrong, she is under security. So when you go in here, you can see Right. Now, a shrewd domain admin might see this and be like, boop, remove. Guess what happens in 60 minutes? I get added right back in. So that's pretty cool. Um, so with her being in there, but not a member, a lot of times I can get past audits. And what I can do is I could also take this and get that password there. I can take that and I can now run as a different user. Bada boom. And I'm in, who am I? I'm Ace Franklin. We could also, so here's the deal. Uh, this is my initial entry point is Ace Franklin, basically. I don't want to lose access to Ace Franklin. I don't want you to know that I'm using Ace Franklin to do nefarious things. So what you do is you, uh, you set up a sacrificial account to do the things that you want, but you also need to control that account. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go net groups, and then we're going to say domain admins, Bill Murray, who we control, add domain. Cool. Bill Murray is a domain admin now. Notice, too many members. We have a policy thing over here that indicated that we added too many members to the domain admins group. Uh, the idea behind this is that you're now going to run a script or something quickly with Bill Murray. So point in time solutions are not going to help you with this. And then when you're done, what you'll do is you'll remove Bill Murray from domain admins. And if you weren't watching it, uh, you know, you're going to miss it. Now notice we also cut standard account with uh, admin count. So something to point out there is that if you add a user, a normally domain user to uh, a trusted group like domain admins, this is something attackers forget to clean up after they've done this. Um, so I'm going to actually show you where it is. Admin count attribute set on standard user. This attribute is still existing on Bill Murray. Every domain user has the admin count set to zero. If you add it at a user to domain admins or enterprise admins, that kind of thing, it becomes a one. And when you remove a user from those, those groups back to a domain user, Microsoft does not clean up after itself. So that admin count stays one. So if you see a user with admin count one and they are not a domain admin, either they used to be or an attacker has been there. <laughs> And they used to be. Either way, they used to be. So uh, that's something to go check out. Um, so actually, I'm going to show you another sneaky way of doing this. Uh, hopefully, let me know if I'm getting too long on time. Uh, I know there's someone else that's going to be talking to. But 
Um, there's You're good. This, I'm good. All right. Cool. Um, so if I were able to control, say, this nested OU account, right, uh, Suruduha, which actually it's supposed to be Shurudui, I don't know, I can't, it's like Japanese for sharp blade. Anyway, um, basically, if I controlled this account, what I want to do is hide it. And so what you can do, let me show you this real quick. This is kind of crazy. Oh, is it administrator? Yes, because I have domain admin. All right, so if I do net uh, users, and then let's say um, I just go find string uh, SHA is that domain or that um, account name. So go in here, you can see that SHA exists under domain users. Well, what if I were to go to users and let's say we create a group or look for a group that already exists. Like let's say here's IT ops. That's a good one. If we look at members here, we can see there's domain admins, help desk, level two, level three, cool. Well, let's go ahead and go into help desk, go to members. Okay, individual users. Let's go ahead and add this guy to help desk. You might catch that, sure. It's a, it's a risk. But then what we could do is we could go under system, SD holder. Something that you might not question is under these security groups, you might question Ace Franklin, but you might not question IT ops because that looks like they totally belong. We'll give ourselves right permission because we need that. Cool. All right. So now this account and all those help desk people actually have access to maintain persistence in your domain. Check this cool feature out. This is something I learned not too long ago. Um, so if you go to the properties of that container, go to security, uh, we go to advanced, wait for it, spinning wheel of Microsoft, there we go. All right, so you can see everyone has special access by default. Let's go to edit the deny, we're editing deny. Uh, so we're gonna, deny list contents for that OU. So we'll hit okay, okay, okay. Refresh, user disappears completely. But guess what? That user is still part of that group and still a member of SD holder. If I go back over here and I list the user, gone. Doesn't exist. I am a ghost in your domain. And that's pretty sweet. So yeah, that's a fantastic way for me to hide from anyone that's trying to just list users initially so that they can audit the AD environment. I'm now invisible and I'm, I'm listed uh, as having access as a, an, an admin SD holder. So now I can add anyone I want at any, at any time. And it makes it incredibly hard for an admin to go in there and find what just happened. So uh, that's the beauty of something like this, where you want to go like, hey, like who's got access to this? Well, guess what? We found IT ops has that access. You can go into IT ops, trace it back. You'll find that account. So cool. Um, all right. One more uh, fun one would be through group policies. So group policies is another great way to get persistence in a domain. Um, if you're not careful. <laughs> um, so let's open this up. All right, group policy objects, cool. All right, so uh, you can add whatever access you want to these. So theoretically, you could grant users in your domain access to edit certain ones of these, but not all. That's a way that you allow site administrators to manage their own um, you know, sites and not the entire domain, right? Um, so when you look at things like, uh, I don't know, like our default domain policy, for example, which is the one we should be protecting the most, um, you should definitely be auditing this. Uh, we see uh, account Yosemite Sam is in there. That seems a little odd that that would be the case. Um, you can go to delegation and we can go to advanced and take a look at what's going on here. Yosemite Sam actually has full control which domain admins don't even have full control on that. So this particular user account would be another good one to do a DC sync on so that we could gain access to uh, edit just this GPO if we wanted to. Now that's all well and good. You're probably gonna audit and find that. 
well, here's a cool little stealthy way to actually do stuff like that without getting caught, especially if you're in a single floor, single domain. Um, the sites area, which actually gets the lowest precedence, all these other things trump sites, but uh, sites is invisible by default. So you have to go in and enable it. So if you open that up, you'll see the first site. There is a GPO in here called do not delete. Uh, if you were to um, look at the details of it, and settings, close, um, you'll see that there is a AP platypus recon dot bat in here. That's interesting. So, you know, if we copy this, see if I can copy it. All right, copy selection. We can open up Explorer here and go take a look. So we're, oops, I'm gonna paste the password in there. Uh, fine, I'll just manually type it, i tell you. All right, cool. 192.168.222.105. And then AP Platypus. Cool. All right, so we're in here. Okay, so that is my, my Mimi Cats tool. We edit this. Actually, hang on. We have, we have, uh, we have Notepad++ on a domain control. Cool. All right. So uh, sweet. Uh, so you look at that. Okay. That guy doesn't, he's not trusted. Anyway, you can see that this is uh, definitely doing a, a dump of credentials using Mimikatz and then writing it to a directory um, right back here, actually. So uh, it wrote the computer name that got DC synced and it put the results in here. So here's all the results of those credentials. I'm not going to actually open those, but Yes, it's true. It will only work if the user has uh, local uh, or an administrative permission, but I'm going to get somebody, right? And people are not looking in here for these uh, group policies because they don't typically look at the site level if it's, like I said, single floor, single domain. Uh, and again, permissions are not probably great on there. Now, what I could do is I could, again, do the IT ops group in here instead of like um, it's something like LDAP test, for example, which again is overly permissive. Um, I could add that in there. So then I don't even need to log into the domain controller. I can just use the MMC snap in, load up group policy management. I can edit um, those from there. And of course, you know, with group policy, you can deploy, you know, any software you want to a any domain joined asset right through the startup shutdown executables. Uh, and that's where we find. Uh, that what, what was going on. So uh, anyway, so I hope this has been fun. I, I don't know what, what time looks like, but I, I at least wanted to show you guys a couple of cool methods that I used to use to uh, maintain persistence in a domain and show you some of the, the tools, tactics, and procedures, if you will. Um, so yeah, any, uh, any questions on any of that? Yeah, anybody got any questions for John? This was... Pretty awesome to see how e awesome, frightening <laughs> to see how how easy some of that is. So, but you know, I also think like so, people's Active Directory's been around for twenty years, right? In some situations, so we didn't really have great hygiene back then. Let hey, alone now. Hey Matt, can I ask a quick question? This is Doug, and then I gotta hop off because I have another call. But John, I mean, you talked about some of these things that you can do with PowerShell, right, locally. Mm -hmm. And and I know one of the best practices is to say is to not allow you end users to use PowerShell, but what's the easiest way to do that? Yeah, so that's tough because uh, the policy, the execution, uh, execution bypass is really uh, quite easy to get around if you are putting something on there for PowerShell. Um, really, okay. you know, monitoring for command execution, like any administrative command that's being run by an end user should probably not be allowed. Um, PowerShell has fantastic logging, actually. It's way better than anything we used to have back with the old command prompt days. Um, so okay. yeah, that, that's helpful. But that, not a great way to prevent it, but probably decent ways to detect it. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Good stuff. Yeah, Good question. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Doug.